Well, good morning, my sisters and brothers in Christ. I welcome you to the, the worship service of the New England Baptist Church. My name is Les Venable. I'm the pastor here, and there have been several greetings over the last few days. Happy New Year. I don't know how exactly to respond to that. I want to respond in kind. I want to extend that same greeting, but my prayer is that it sure is a different year than last year. So I hope we do have a happy new year. And thank you all for extending those wishes to me. And now I extend them to you. Happy new year. I pray that you will have a year that's filled with happiness and joy and not all the drama that we had to experience last year. Uh, well, I guess once we get through January and whatever they're doing with, uh, with Congress, but we'll, that's a different matter. Um, a few announcements before we begin our worship service. Uh, we did receive a letter of thanks from the New Kent Christmas Mother for the participation of our church. Several members uh, adopted children, and they're very grateful for the opportunity that uh, we took, or some took on our behalf, to bless children in the community so that they might have a, a joyful Christmas. And so they were very excited about that. There was a second letter that came from the United States Department of Agriculture, offering us the opportunity to uh, as, uh, have one serve on an advisory committee. Uh, I'm going to uh, scan that letter and send it out as a distribution through email uh, after we clarify something else. The something else is typically we have the food distribution on the second uh, Saturday of the month, which would in this case have been January uh, 9th, I guess it is, 8th or 9th. Uh, but we've not yet gotten the actual certification that the funds are going to be available. And so uh, we assume they are. We're making plans around that, but we do not know yet. And so when we get the word, we will notify you. Uh, electronically, and then I need you all to get on the Underground Railroad that you got and make sure everybody knows the ways that we communicate with one another uh, when we'll be distributing that food or if that possibility still exists. I'm pretty sure it will be prayerfully. A reminder that the Women's Bible Study, uh, the small group, will meet today after 11. Seems like it's going to be a good study if I look at the amount of preparation that has gone into it around my house. I think that's going to be a, a good study. And uh, if you have not been um, participating and, and feel like, you know, you're not invited, I want to make sure uh, as, a, as a woman, as a lady, that you are invited. You know, just use the same link that you use for worship, and they won't mind you coming in. Uh, you won't have a book, but you won't need And you know, I've been talking all this time and I'm not saying anything. That's, um, all right. Well, let me start over. Good morning. Welcome to New England Baptist Church. I'm Les Venable. I'm the pastor here. Uh, I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and thank you all for coming in to be with us. Uh, very quickly, uh, we received a, uh, a thank you from the New Kent. A Christmas mother for the participation of several of our members in that program who have blessed uh, children over the Christmas holiday. We received a secondary letter from the U.S. Department of Agriculture inviting uh, someone to serve on a board that would affect um, land usage in our area. I'm going to scan that letter and send it out in case you're interested in participating and being a part of that. Uh, the second part is I'm going to need to send out an announcement because typically on the second Saturday we do the food distribution here, but we have not received the actual certification that the funds are available. Uh, we make an assumption they are, we pray they are, but as soon as we get the word, uh, we will need to, to get that word out to you. And so that will happen in the next day or so, and I'll include that letter uh, on, the, uh, on the email that you receive. So today is a day that uh, the women's Bible study meets after after our worship concludes. I mean, at 11 o'clock, uh, it's not a closed meeting. If you're a woman and you want to be a part of that, even if you don't have one of the books that they are studying from, uh, you're welcome to participate. I'm sure they would welcome you. So that would be at 11 today. 
And we had scheduled initially uh, the resumption of our Wednesday night Bible study for this Wednesday. I'm going to need an extra week to get ready. So Bible study will actually start on January 13th on Wednesday night. Um, the food distribution and our church business meeting are in contention. Normally our, our church business meeting is the second Saturday in the month, which would have been January. Uh, we made that fluid in November and because we thought the food distribution was the more critical element there. Uh, we have a few items that you need to be aware of for our church business meeting and there's really no issues. Uh, what you need to be aware of is our financial condition, which is good. Uh, we are, we're in the black as I understand the numbers. And uh, the second thing is, what do we mean? What, what happens about church uh, opening up again? Do we come back? And uh, as you know, you see the same numbers I see, the numbers of people who are infected, the number of people who are in, in, in hospitalized are increasing. And so we continue to, to minister um, through Zoom as we, as we meet congregationally. We'll try to find other opportunities to meet together collectively, uh, but we will continue to minister outside the church. And that's where I think God has, has been successful with us in, in doing his work. And then a reminder um, that there's the Martin Luther King celebration, January 18th. Some of you may have some plans around that, but we'll clarify all that this week. I said a lot of stuff, but bulk of it is uh, there's a, uh, a women's Bible study today at 11, the church business meeting. Uh, it will revolve around the food distribution and we'll know more about that the first part of the week. So as we begin our service together, I want to ask uh, Deaconess Wright if she will lead us in our meditation this morning, and then we'll have our first song by the choir. Deaconess Wright. Yes. Good morning, New Elam. I'll be reading Psalms 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, hmm. and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punish us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is, is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant and to those who remember his commandments to do them. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, 
heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. May the Lord bless the hearers and the doers of this holy word. Will you bow with me while I pray? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not, Lord, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the glory and thine is the kingdom and the power forever. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, and thank you, Sister Wright, for leading us in that. Now we'll have our first song for the morning. Again, Sister Wright. I thank you, choir, for setting the tone for our, our first uh, meeting of the year because 
Worshiping our God is really what ought to be our primary consideration above all else. And so come let us worship the Lord as an appropriate song as we lead into the new year. And in fact, it will be the, the content of the message today, which comes from Colossians, the third chapter, verses 23, 24, if you want to, uh, to look that up while uh, you have a few minutes. We've got some time. But at this time, we want to, again, thank you for your contributions uh, this year. You have been uh, mindful of the responsibilities we have as, as believers and as uh, fellow believers of the New England Baptist Church to support the ministry that goes on here. Uh, we can't do it without you. No one person can do it alone. And so your faithful giving has been a real blessing uh, to us. And we thank God for you. And, and we'll ask the deacon this morning to give God thanks as well for your faithfulness and mindfulness of, you know, our responsibility to be good givers and good livers. Um, we have some prayer concerns. Um, we one thank God for uh, uh, a very appropriate and and, and mindful and, and very well done service home going for Mother Annabelle Ellis Abrams. Uh, it was done well. We thank the March General Home for their many considerations and making sure that uh, we were felt safe in, in conducting it. And regrettably, we couldn't do it here in the sanctuary because of the COVID restrictions, but they did a fine job, and I've talked to members of the family, and they've been satisfied. And thank you all for the many considerations you've given to the family and continue to, 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 to love on them right now because the service is over, but this is when the real grieving begins. So be mindful of our brothers and sisters in the Abrams family and extend to them, you know, your heartfelt wishes as they continue to recover in the loss of their matriarch and family matriarch. Um, we still continue to pray for our brother Gerard Taylor and pray that the, the, the COVID outbreak in, in his facility has been moderated. He is safe. We want to continue to keep him in prayer. Uh, we have some friends who are not immediate members, and we thank God that no one this week that I know of is hospitalized or, you know, any illness is serious. But none of the uh, none of the uh, illnesses that I've heard about have caused people to be hospitalized. But I do have uh, I've come to to know about a few people that I would ask you to pray about. You may not know them. One is named Sandra Jones who has been diagnosed with uh, breast cancer, and she's, she's fighting that. And Jane Baskerville, another friend. Same thing, another friend I have named Perry Benchester. All these names have been brought to my attention and asked for prayer. And, and Mother Jefferson, uh, Evelyn Jefferson, uh, we talk about you know, her raised her name uh, several weeks. Uh, her son is our deacon, and he's with her even now. You may see him uh, with us joining in on worship but he's there minister, um, ministering to his mother. And, and we need to pray for his wife. We, we need to pray for his wife because there's, this is a family affair. And, and while he is taking care of mom, you know, she is uh, having to deal with not having her husband there. And so we want to pray for the whole Jefferson family and also his sister, uh, Sandra Fox, among others that we may know who are suffering in one way or another. And so I ask now if uh, Deacon Wright, if you would bless for us our offering and then also give consideration to those who are sick, those who are recovering, and those who are suffering. Amen. Let us, let us pray. Our Father and our God who art in heaven, Lord Jesus, we, we come at this hour to first lift you up, to give you praise, and to give you honor. Father, we ask that you will bless the offerings that we receive here at New Elam. Father, we ask that you will continue to bless the givers who gave out of a cheerful heart, Master. And bless those who had the desire to give also, Lord, for we know in due time that they will be willing to give also. Lord, we pray, God, that the, the use of our offerings will be a continual ministry here on earth so that someone who may be lost, who may not know you in the pardon of their sins, Father, that one of our saints could come to them and tell them the good news of your son, Jesus Christ. And they too will ask, what must I do to be saved? And Father, we then know that all of our works, all of our offerings, everything that we've done has been blessed by you so that we can bless others. 
So we ask you, Father, to look upon us with favor this morning and to bless our offerings. But we also, Father, want to be grateful and mindful that we are here today, Father, because you saw fit that we could come into your house of worship one more time. And we're thankful for that, Father. We're grateful for that. We're here, Father, because last year was a turbulent, troubled year for most of us. But you gave us the strength. You've given us the vision and you've given us the fortitude. But most of all, Father, you led us and we followed by faith that we have come into a new year. We look forward, Father, and not back. For you told us that in your word that we're to always look forward and leave the past behind us. We look for a new year. We look for more grace and we look for more mercy, Father. And Father, we looked at, we would put our hands and our feet to the plow, Father, and not turn back. But mm -hmm. we will do your will this year, Father. If we have been slowful, forgive us, Lord. If we, if we did not have our hearts in the right places, forgive us this day, Lord. Father, if we did not say a kind word when we knew we ought to, forgive us. For we know we're not a perfect person, but we know that your grace and your mercy will cover us. And we look forward to doing the will, your will, Father, in this new year. Bless this church, Father, in a mighty way. Bless our officers, our leaders. Oh, Lord, bless us all, Father, as you know that we stand in need of. And Father, we want to be mindful of those who did not cross over to the new year. We want to keep them in mind, Father. We want to pray for their families. We want to pray for their household, Father. But most of all, Father, we pray for every living one's soul. We pray, God, that they will be renewed in their spirits. And as the scripture will say, we will mount up on eagle wings. We will run and not get tired. And Father, we will look forward to that great day of serving you one more time. Father, we ask that you will bless our sick among us. Father, we pray that you will touch them this morning. But the weak, we pray, God, that you will give them strength. And the lonely, Father, we pray that you will give them comfort and a friendship. And Father, that one that has walked away from you, Father, we pray, God, that your angel of mercy will touch them also. Yeah. And let them know that your door is always open and that they can put all things behind them and come through anew. We're so thankful, Lord, for everything that you have blessed us with. If we had a thousand tongues, Father, we could not thank you enough. We thank you for the little things, the, the, the large things that you have blessed us with. But most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And we praise you this morning. And we lift up our voices to you this morning. And we pray, God, that you will hear us one more time. These are the things that we ask as we go into our worship hour for your, through your son, Jesus Christ. And we also pray for it. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you, sir. God bless you and God bless all those who are holding on to things that have not been spoken, but still we lift it all to Jesus Christ, who is the healer, the provider, and the one that we can always count on to, to help us in our times of need. And so we give thanks and thank you, Deacon Wright, and Deacon Miss Wright for leading us in worship today. As I mentioned, the, uh, the sermon Ty, uh, text today is from Colossians, the, the New Testament book of Colossians, the third chapter. It's only going to be two verses, but before we do that reading, we'll have another song by our choir. <laughs>
love Jesus. I hope you could see me getting excited in there because I do love Jesus. And I love Jesus because he first loved me. That's the context of the, uh, of the message today from Colossians, the third chapter, verses 23, 24. I choose two verses out of a complicated text, but two verses that matter very much this year, this time, today. And in the uh, New International Version, it reads this way. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It's the Lord Christ you are serving. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, the doing of his word. Father God, we thank you, Lord, now for this time of, of meditation on the word that you have provided. Pray, Lord, that it will find a resting place in the hearts of your servants, that we might come to understand what it is you would have us to do through your word. Have our hearts open and our ears attuned to hearing what it is you have to say. And Lord, bless me in a special way that I might be able to give meaning to the words that you have left for your people to understand. In Jesus' name, amen. Colossians 3, 23, 24. Now, and I've titled this, Get Fired Up. Get Fired Up. Uh, I'm going to start with a story. For nearly 3,000 years, we've eaten bread. But it took the creative efforts of one man to revolutionize the way that we eat bread. You see, in the early 1900s, a young man named Iro Rodwater was overheard a familiar complaint among housewives about how tedious it was having to slice bread, how burdensome it was, how time consuming, and sometimes even even it was even perilous. They cut themselves. Rod would have thought, well, you know, what, what if there was a machine at Baker's head that could pre-slice bread? So Otto was so moved to create and help that he sold his jewelry business and, and started on a long, painful journey to bring his invention to life. In 1916, he built his first prototype of a bread slicing machine in an abandoned warehouse outside of town. He failed. After the initial failure, he tried again. He went back to his warehouse and he kept sketching hundreds of blueprints. And, and then in 1917, a fire broke out. He had all his blueprints in that, in that warehouse and all of a sudden, all his blueprints and years of hard work were burned to ash. The warehouse burned to the ground. By 1927, he had built a new and improved bread slicing machine, but unfortunately, nobody showed any interest. The thing was huge. It was five foot three, and it, it just took up way too much space. Nobody cared. Finally, after a friend stepped in and invested in the project, in July 28th, in, in July of 1928, the first loaf of commercially sliced bread was sold. A newspaper ad claimed that the sliced bread was the greatest forward step in the baking industry since bread was wrapped. A phrase which was eventually hacked into modern day saying, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Sales of sliced bread took off and in late 1930, a New York based company used Rodweller's machines to build an entire business around this whole concept of sliced bread. The product you may know even today because it's called Wonder Bread. Today, calling something to be the greatest thing since sliced bread is a compliment. It's a, a testament to the ingenuity. It's a testament to the decades that Otto spent toiling in his workshop to bring something unique to the world. Something unique he brought to the world one slice, one slice at a time. I'm not here to smooth it over. We've had a hard year. I don't care who you are. We've all had what you have to describe as a hard year. And yet, despite what we have experienced, God is calling upon us to set all that behind. This is 2021. So let's approach 2021 with positive enthusiasm and with passion. 
for 2021. Get fired up because the world is waiting for you. The creative force behind all great art, behind all great drama, all great music, all great architecture, all great writing is passion. Nothing great is ever accomplished in life without passion. Nothing great is ever uh, sustained in life without passion. Passion is that thing that energizes our life. Passion makes the, the impossible possible. Passion gives you a reason to get up in the morning and go and say, you know, I'm going to do something with my life today. Without passion, life becomes boring. It becomes monotonous, it becomes routine. It becomes dull. God created you with emotions to have passion in your life, and he wants you to have a passionate life. Passion is what mobilizes armies into action. Passion is what causes explorers to go boldly, they say, where no person has ever gone before. Passion is what causes scientists to stay up late at night trying to find a cure to this dreaded disease that is affecting our communities. Passion is what the caretakers that we see in the hospitals, the daily pictures we see, how they continue to minister to us and to those who are sick and those who are dying. Passion. Passion is what takes for a good athlete to turn him or her into a great athlete to the point that they're breaking records. You've got to have passion in your life if you want your life to have meaning. You may recall the story of a man who walks up to Jesus and says, Lord, what's the most important thing in the Bible? Jesus says, I want you to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and your strength. And nothing, my friend, matters more than that. That's the number one thing in life. Jesus tells this person, I want you to love me passionately. Nothing else matters in life if you don't love God passionately. God doesn't want you to love him half-heartedly. In Revelation 3.16, and I remember 3.16 because my birthday is March 15, and of course the pandemic came on March 16. So remember Revelation 3.16, not because of my birthday, but because God gave a very stern warning in Revelation 3.16. He said that he will spit the half-hearted from his mouth. He wants you to love him with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. God is saying, I want you to put some energy, some emotion into your relationship with me. Stop being wimpish about your relationship with me. Don't be half-hearted. You're going to have to give it all you've got. Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to do it with passion. You've got to give it some enthusiasm, some jest. I want you to live passionately. And it's not just here in Revelation that we see this. It's all throughout the Bible. Jesus, the Bible says, the Bible tells us that we are to seek God and Jesus passionately. We are to love God passionately. The Bible says that we're to serve and obey God passionately. We're to trust God passionately. And, and then if you didn't get the message in Colossians 3.23, because it's a very difficult text, you may want to skip over it because what surrounds it. But here he says, whatever you do, it do it with, with all your heart is unto the Lord and not unto men. He said, I want you to do everything passionately when it comes to loving me, serving me, living for me. And here's the sad thing. In, in America, you know, it seems we've got great passion about everything or anything except God. It's not politically correct these days to be passionate about God. It's okay to be passionate about a movie. It's okay to be passionate about sports. I can be passionate about politics. I could march up and down the street about my candidate. I, I can be passionate about fashion and clothes. I can be passionate about the restaurants that I want to get back to. I can be passionate about my cars and my motorcycles, but I can't be passionate about God. No. Being passionate about God is, is not politically correct. And if we display passion about God, we become victims of what's called cancel culture. 
cancel culture, or some people call it call out culture. It's a modern form of ostracism where we want to kick you out because someone is thrust out of a professional or a, a social circle, either online or on social media or in the real world or in any of those environments. Those are the subjects of this ostracism are said to be canceled. You don't fit into our way of thinking and so we write you out. We leave you out because you're not politically correct. You see, in our culture, it's okay to be passionate about anything except your religion, except your faith, except your relationship with God. It's okay to go to a concert, to a music concert. I can get passionate about what's coming on television. I can get passionate about a political rally or a football game. If I go to a football game, I can shout my head off. I can get excited. I can get hoarse from yelling so loud. When my team loses, oh, I just shed great tears. And nobody thinks that's a big deal. But when my team wins, oh, I can jump up and dance around and, and wave my hands in the air and poke all kind of posts on social media. But if I do that at a game, people go, hey, look at that guy, he's a real fan. But if you jump up like that in church, people say, something's wrong with him. He's a fanatic. He's a nutcase. You don't want to get too emotional about your faith. It's okay about anything else, but it's not okay to get passionate about your faith in modern culture. But Romans 12, one says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Keep the fires going in your life. I lift that particular pericope, that piece of scripture, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Notice the word keep. Underline the word keep. Focus on the word keep because it's not automatic. It's a choice. Keeping is a discipline. It's something you have to maintain. You are not by nature passionate about God. It's something that you got to choose to do. You can get distracted and everything in life and works hard to keep you from being passionate about God. So he says, keep your, keep your passion going. Keep your fires going. It's a discipline. And it's not just automatic. This kind of thing, being passionate about God, has nothing to do with either your personality or your age. Our church has been filled with hundreds, if not thousands, of senior believers who have walked with God a long, long time, and they're still passionate about their walk with the Lord. I could give you hundreds of names of people that I know personally who have lived passionately for God for years and years and years. But the greatest example of passion that I know of was Jesus coming to earth to sacrifice his life to show us how passionately he wanted us to live lives free of sin. This is quite a sacrifice. He came to earth. He made the sacrifice. All my sins are forgiven. I now have a purpose for living. I now have a future home in heaven. This is the greatest deal of all times. And you know what? We get excited about that when you give your first life to Christ. Oh, when you first give your life to Christ, you were so passionate. This is so wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. But as time goes by, you begin to lose your steam. You begin to lose your zip. You start to lose your zest, your enthusiasm. We get routine. What happens? Why does this happen? Well, that's what I want to take a few more minutes to look at today. Today, we're going to look at passion killers, things that rob the joy in your life. And I thought this would be a very appropriate message as we begin the new year. After the worst year many of us have ever experienced. At this time, when nobody feels very passionate about much of anything, you know, truth is, I, we just want to chill. We want to lay back a little bit, try and forget the madness of 2020. But God calls on us to reject our pity party. 
So let's look very briefly at these passion killers. What is it that has knocked us off? I want you to use it as a checklist, but God says, I want you to love me with all your heart. That's the first thing. And so the first passion killer that I'm going to talk about is unused talent. See, an unused talent will cause you to lose your passion for life and your passion for God. In 1 Peter 4.10, you'll see these words. Each of you has been blessed with one of God's many wonderful gifts to be used in the service of others. So use your gifts well. Notice God gives you certain talents, abilities, personality, gifts, the shape that he's given you and those gifts, those talents that he's given you are not for your benefit. They're for the benefit of other people, scripture says. My gifts are for your benefit. Your gifts are for my benefit. You are to use those gifts in the service of other people. God has given you a special role in this world, Christian. He wants you to make a contribution with your life. God says, I have given you these gifts. I have given you these talents. And if you don't use your talents, you're going to lose your passion. And unfortunately, if you don't use your gifts, they will begin to diminish. God did not give you special abilities just to sit on them and do nothing with them. God says, I want you to use it. Oh, but trust me, you're going to lose it. A second passion killer is an unconfessed sin. Few things rob us of our joy, rob us of our confidence, rob us of our passion more quickly than guilt. And, and here's how it works. Here's how it works with guilt, the sin in our lives. See, we don't walk around thinking, uh, I got this sin in my life and, 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 I, and I'm a guilty person. No, we want to rationalize this. We want to rationalize this consciously. So consciously, we begin to think, you know, it, it, it's not just me. Everybody's doing it. It's no big deal. But your conscience is gnawing at you. Subconsciously, it is gnawing at you continually. Subconsciously, whenever it gets quiet, that guilt pops into your mind. And here's the truth about us as human beings. We cannot feel enthusiasm and guilt at the same time. You can't feel guilt and passion at the same time because guilt by its very definition robs you of passion. Psalm 38, four and six says, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. I am bowed down and I am brought low. The battle between sin and passion creates conflict that just drains the passion right out of you. Have you ever got up in the morning thinking, oh, this is going to be a great day. You just wake up knowing this is going to be a fantastic. You hop out of bed. You are awake from the moment you get up. You're enthusiastic. You're ready for the day. You get your shower. You get your breakfast. You're ready. You're on your way out the door. And all of a sudden, you got to fight with somebody in your house before you can get out of the house. Or you get a call from somebody who wants to take all the air out of your balloon. And that's what conflict does to us. It takes all the passion out of our lives. Your attitude all of a sudden when somebody else comes and wants to take it away is just, we get flat. And sometimes you lose passion for God because you're not spending enough time around people who love God, around other Christians. You're just not getting any fellowship. There's a very practical verse in Ecclesiastes that says, just common sense from the Bible, it says two are better than one. Because if one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the one who falls and has no one to help him up. My friends, we need each other. Yeah, I keep hearing people talking about, well, I don't need to go to church. I'm a spiritual person. I get my spirituality from God. I'm all right. No, you're not all right. You need other people. You need other people to help you fight the battle against the devil because we all fall sometimes. We all stumble sometimes. 
So we got to have other people in our lives to help us to resolve the sins that we are hiding and help us to resolve and, and confess them and get rid of them so that we might have joy, so that we might have purpose. And purpose is the third thing. <clears throat> the third passion killer is refusing to accept your purpose in life. When you forget your purpose for life, that's a sure way to kill your passion for life and for God. If you don't know what your purpose is for life, why bother, you say? Why, why get up in the morning? Why, why put forth the effort? Why get out of bed? Life without purpose is activity without direction. It's motion without meaning. Life without purpose is trivial. It's petty. It's pointless. Every day, you're going to face all kinds of circumstances that conspire to shrink your spirit. Things are going to come against you that try to shrivel your heart. You're going to get up in the morning and you're going to have distractions and disappointments. You're going to have conflicts. You're going to have changes. You're going to have challenges. You're going to have problems and pressures. You're going to have frustrations and fears and failures and fatigue. And all these things fall in on you and they just try to shrivel your heart and, and shrink your spirit. So you've got to intentionally nourish your spirit. If you don't do it, nobody else is going to do it for you. You cannot do it alone. Nobody else is going to nourish your spirit. Again, it's necessary to be in communication and fellowship with other believers. So if you don't take the time and trouble to do it, it's going to shrivel you up. So how do you do it? Well, first, you need to have a time of work with God every day. Every day where you just slow down and you get to know God, private worship, not just your public explanation, exclamation, all the things you sent out about how good God is. You better get quiet and get with God. You better get to know God in a very private way and make sure he knows you because you need fellowship with other believers. But first, you've got to be right with God. So you need to read God's word and grow to be more like Christ. You need to have a ministry where you feel like you're using your talents to help other people. And you need a mission in the world where you're sharing your faith. If you just choose one of those purposes and forget the others, you're going to be imbalanced. And it'll cause you to lose your passion. You need them all. And, and, and the starting point, the, the starting point in reclaiming your passion is remembering how God feels about you. Oh, you know it, but you might have forgotten it. But I want you to understand that God is helplessly, hopelessly in love with you. The reason that you're not passionate about God is you've forgotten how passionate God is about you. In Exodus 31, 14, it says, you must worship only the Lord. For he is a God who is passionate about his relationship with you. I hope you know that. I hope you know that God is passionate about you. He made you to love you and to love him. You were created as an object of his love. The more you understand how God is passionate about the, you, the more passionate you're going to be about God. When you forget how much God loves you, you start blowing God off and going, well, forget it. I don't need God. I mean, I, we're all right. I got other things to do. I got my Facebook I got to keep up with. I got my Steelers. I got to figure out what they're doing. My Dallas Cowboys, my Baltimore Ravens. I got to see what's going on with them too. I got my car. There's a good movie coming on tonight. I can think of a whole lot of diversions other than getting close to God. And how do I know? How do I know that God is passionate about you? How do I know that God is passionate about us? Because the proof is that cross. The proof is that cross. Jesus stretched out his hands and they nailed him to the cross. And he was in essence saying, I would rather die without you. I would rather die than live without you. That's how passionate I am about my creation. He stood on that cross. He hung on that cross in, in, 
in the name of the Father and, and said, I made you and I, and I love you and I'd rather die than live without you. In fact, the suffering of Jesus on the cross was the ultimate display of his passion for us. Friends, God dwells in a state of perpetual enthusiasm and passion for us. He is delighted with all that is good and, and he is lovingly concerned about all that's wrong. And, and he is zealous in demonstrating his love for us. Remember how the spirit came at Pentecost? Huh? It's the sound of a rushing wind, it says, and it sat in tongues of fire on every forehead. Whatever else happened at Pentecost, one thing that cannot be missed by the most casual observer was this sudden eruption, upsurge of enthusiasm. And those first disciples burned with a steady inward fire. They were enthusiastic to the point of complete abandon. And God wants us to be passionate toward him. And that passion will affect every aspect of our lives. 2020 can affect us when we take on and remember that God loves us and reclaim the passion that he has for us and that we have for him. And how does this manifest itself? Well, a friend was telling me, she was sitting on a bench at the beach at the boardwalk late one afternoon, enjoying the environment. And, and a lady walked by brown pants, blue shirt, had her little uniform. She was pushing a broom, saw her pass by several times up and down the boardwalk. And so as she got closer toward my friend's bench during this meticulous sweeping of the sidewalk, she, she suddenly stopped and, and wiped her forehead and rested on her broom. And my friend called out to her and said, you're doing a great job. And the lady turned and replied, thank you. And then she added something that explained why the sidewalk behind her was spotless. She said, I just believe people want to walk on a clean sidewalk. She said that my friend said she was humbled in the presence of a worker who viewed her task with such significance. Whatever the city of Virginia Beach was paying her, there's no way they could have demanded the excellence that she brought to her work. That kind of motivation comes from within. It comes from passion to do everything in her life well, the best she could. She was passionate about her work and God was pleased. This month, we will commemorate the birthday of Martin Luther King. My friends, experience brings to recall the word Dr. King also had on this matter of passion. And we should never forget these words because he said, if it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, street sweets like Michelangelo painted pictures, sweep streets like Beethoven composed music, sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry, sweep streets so well that when all the hosts of heaven and earth We'll have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. 2020 with all its misery is gone. And you know what? We, we need to let the sadness, the depression, the fatigue, the fear be gone with it. This year, 2021, let, let's focus on hearing and, and seeing from God and, and letting him know just how much we love him. I only have one resolution for you. It's the resolution for me and I hope you'll share it. I'm gonna get fired up in 2021. Father God, we thank you that you have brought us through the fire. We thank you that you brought us through the flood. And we know, Lord, that it's only because of your passion toward us that we have come this far along the way. Maybe we've gotten to the point where we have relied on people making announcements and analyzing numbers. That we've let our passion for you slide a little bit.
but we're not doing it anymore, Lord. We pray today, starting today, this year, we're getting fired up about you. We're getting fired up about our relationship with you because we know that you are the God of forever. You are the God of all eternity. And if today there's one who has been humbled by 2020 and you've never really made the confession to let Jesus Christ be the Lord of your life, let this be the day. Let this be the time. Let someone who hears this message get the word to you that God loves you. Let him be the Lord of your life and everything, and I mean everything, is going to be all right. Get fired up, Lord. We're coming. We're coming in your name. Bless us as we come in Jesus' name. While the choir sings, there may be one who wants to make a confession. We'll be happy to, to help you just get in touch with us. But now we'll hear the choir and then we'll have our benediction for the day. us to salvation. He's calling us to relationship. For those of us who've heard the old, old story, those of us who know the salvation story are called to go about and cast our bread upon the waters. Cast the bread of our resources. Cast, cast, the, cast the bread of our faith. This is a very troubled world we're living in, and God has called us to be the solution. It's not found in Congress. It's not found in your Supreme Court. It's, a, it's found in your Supreme Maker. And we are called to be his hands and feet. So the benediction for you today, will you stand and receive? Lord, please hear our hearts and let us hear your heart as we leave from this place. Help us to know that you have called us into a work. You have called us into a work. You called us, Lord, into a, a place of acknowledgement that the, uh, the serum that so many people are dependent on is not the answer, that you are the answer. You are the eternal the all-wise, the everlasting. And so now, Lord, may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord. You are our strength. You are our Redeemer. In your name we praise you. Amen. God bless you all.